journey as well for, for them to go to. And just to give you a little bit of um, an example, when I opened my business here in Thunder Bay, obviously I didn't have any credit history because I wasn't born and raised uh, in Canada. So things that you don't think about, like going to get a telephone for your office, well guess what, you can't get a telephone if you've never had a telephone account, right? So I didn't have a profile with t Tell, so they really didn't want to give me a telephone. And so I'm thinking, hmm, how am I going to start this PR company with no telephone number? Um, things like owning a vehicle, going to buy a car is uh, very difficult. You have to have credit history. So all of those types of things become challenges that other entrepreneurs don't face. And I know today there's a lot of new programs that are available to support uh, newcomer entrepreneurs. But 15 years ago when I came to Thunder Bay, those types of things didn't exist. So I can tell you I used to hop on the bus with my briefcase and then pretend to walk through the parking lot to a, a client meeting that, you know, like I had a car and, uh, and I didn't. So it made it very difficult to get around the city and, uh, and make it to meetings and, and run my business efficiently. Um, some of the challenges I think um, that we have to consider as um, employers when we're talking about hiring newcomers is um, teaching our workplaces and our employees to be um, understanding of different cultures um, and be sensitive to different um, lifestyles. And when I say that, um, you know, when we have a diverse workforce, people have different religious practices, different cultural practices, and some of these things may not be um, well known to your entire employee base. And so, as an employer myself, I can tell you that I've had difficulties with some of my employees who don't understand why certain employees get different holidays than they do, or different times to take lunch than they do. And I have a, a young guy who I hope is gonna come later today um, to the conference who works for me, who he is a Muslim, and so he, he takes time on Friday afternoons to do prayer time. And so it took a while for my team to get used to the fact that he wouldn't be available between those times. And so just simple things like booking meetings where he would expect, be expected to be there, we have to change the way we consider our work day a little bit to accommodate him. And um, I know by law you don't have to do those things, but again, I think that if you want to make your workplace uh, feel welcoming, it's all about flexibility. And we do the same thing for young mothers who are struggling to take kids to do doctor's appointments. Um, we do the same things for, for different employees for different personal reasons. And I think that we have to take that same approach uh, with our uh, newcomers in our, in our workplaces. There's so many benefits for me to having um, a diverse workforce at FireDog. And obviously, we always talk about the talent shortage. And, and we know that there are certain careers in the region where we struggle to recruit. Um, and, and so the young fellow that just recently came to work for me was an international student at Lincoln University, and he is a web programmer. And we had struggled for a long time to find good, qualified um, web programmers. And so very um, lucky to connect with, with Ibrahim and Pierre actually sent him my way because I was putting the feelers out everywhere. Uh, looking for some great talent. And, and so I think that's obviously uh, a really key benefit, but I love the fact that it also brings a different um, personality element, if you like, to our workplace. And it results in a lot of laughs and a lot of storytelling and just a lot of community building in our office. And I think it's really good for the rest of my staff. And when I hear the conversations that go on, between um, people who have never heard about what it's like to live in India, and they don't know much about the uh, Islamic religion, and so I hear them asking questions and saying, wow, that's really interesting, and I didn't know about this and about that, and then the same happens in reverse. Um, it's a really great environment to work in, and it's a learning environment, and so I love, I love that in, in my office. And the other great thing I think is um, the, the new ideas. 
So when you come from a different place, you bring new ideas. And I think if we're always generating our ideas and our creativity um, from within, we're going to get pretty stale pretty fast. And so one of the awesome benefits I found of bringing in a diverse workforce is new ideas. So we have, I have people in my office who come from Quebec, and I have people in my office from India, and I have myself from England, and, and we all can talk about, hey, when I lived here and when I lived there, this is how we used to do things, and this, these were some great ideas that worked. And some of them won't work here, because um, they have to be market um, specific, but it's a really great way to generate um, creative thinking and, and new, new ways of doing things and bring them to Northwestern Ontario. The last thing that I really want to talk about is work ethic. And one of the things that I really believe is that um, newcomers have an amazing work ethic. And it's not the typical, oh yeah, well, you have Mexican people and they're willing to work 20 hours a day. You know, and, and the stereotypes that we hear, and I work at Bombardier, and they're a client of mine, and we hear constantly these stereotypes around people from different places that are absolutely not true. But what I can tell you is that when people move to a new community, they want to make it work. They've come a really long way, they've often moved their families, and it's a really big risk for them, whether it's for a job or for personal reasons or whether they're opening a business. And so the work ethic I find of newcomers is absolutely amazing. And if you don't open your business and um, your, your workplace to, to that kind of um, drive and, and talent, then I think it's a really wasted opportunity. So thank you.
so they don't want to invest in the students who might be that for PhD years. And then you have people that are coming in um, who have no language ability. So all of them have a unique challenge in finding work. Um, and how do we how do we overcome that? Um, so from an international students' perspective, looking for work, I think um, one thing is this 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 culture has to change that students will be um, after after finishing their education. I think a lot of students want to stay and they want to work, but their work has to be available, and companies should be willing to invest in these students. And if companies are investing their time into these students, then most likely these students are going to be staying. Um, and how can we empower these students? Um, resume workshops, uh, because I can tell you, I grew up in Qatar, um, there's no concept of, let's say, a cover letter. So anyone coming from there will know what a cover letter is. Because we just send in a CV, we don't even call it a resume, we call it a CV. Um, and, and the way CVs are designed are, you need to put your picture on, you need to put your marks on. So there's a way in, in which employees there uh, look at resumes. Um, so when those people come here and they're applying for jobs, um, they're submitting resumes which probably might not be up to the standard that someone here is looking for. So a resume workshop um, would help students or, or newcomers who are coming uh, to Canada. Um, how would, and another thing is network. So networking is very important because going through university, I was no associate before I went through college there. Uh, then I moved to uh, Thunder Bay. Um, I wasn't very well connected with the community. I wasn't very well connected with the, with the union or different departments on campus. But through networking, I managed to connect with different people in town. Um, and I find that that is very important for any newcomer coming through um, to, to have these networking sessions where they can connect with different companies, different uh, organizations in the city, uh, which would then open doors for them. Um, but there's also barriers, because a lot of new immigrants coming in don't have their language ability. So how are you going to get them to network? So language courses, uh, you know, improving uh, your language uh, that is needed for work, that is important. So uh, I think one way would be to, to set up I know the Multicultural Association does the English language program, so all the immigrants coming in from that do not have the, the language capability uh, go through this program. So once their language improves, then they're put up there into the workplace and they're connected to the purpose. <coughs> I have a list of notes here, so I'm just going to do this. Um, I think support system for for the new commerce uh, uh, is very important. So when I when I say support system, I don't mean that you know you just do a couple of uh, resume workshops and, and, and language courses and that's it. I mean continuous support. Um, these people are coming to a new place. It's a cultural shock. In many cases, it's also a climate shock because you know a lot of them are coming from hot climates and to the table climate. So I know when I was going to high school, if it rained, we didn't go to school. But then it rained here every day. So, you know, so that, that was a, a, a shock for me. Um, but how do you overcome that? You need to have a support system. You need to have mentors who are constantly, you know, for, for a year or two when you move into this place. Um, they're continuously giving you that support. They're continuously mentoring you, asking you, uh, how's the integration going, um, and and so on. Um, and I think having having diverse workplaces, uh, as Stephanie said, it, it uh, brings in new ideas. Places which are perceived as diverse have the highest level of engagement because you're curious about a different culture. You know, someone coming from a different place. Um, 
months, you, you want to learn. Um, and that, that increases the engagement between the employees um, and, and it creates a, a positive environment. I think another thing for, for anyone coming in uh, seeking um, a job uh, would be mock interviews. Um, so for me, I think what would have really helped when I first came here that I would have I would have liked that I would have you know connected with uh, different people uh, in the city and, and, and some sort of mock interviews. So. Um, you know, when you go into an interview, how do you dress up? Uh, how do you answer questions? How do you talk to people? Those set of skills are very handy when you're applying for a job. A lot of people growing up here already have those skills, but people coming from other parts of the world might not necessarily have those skills. So putting them through those workshops uh, would really help. Um, and uh, my advice, for anyone hiring newcomers would be patience. I think you know if you're giving someone a chance to work for you, um, they might not reach the standard that you require them to reach within the first year, but if you're patient with them, you give them time, um, I assure you that you know they will come up with the standard that you require them to reach. A lot of them are very hard working and you know committed uh, so patience is, is the one advice that I would give anyone hiring immigrants um, that are right in hand. I think that's all I have to say. Um, and I have a question that I have on to you.
grown over, over time, we wanted to recruit people from all over the world and try and find ways to do that. And how do you, how do you reach out to people so that they understand that you have a diverse workplace? It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I think that working with community partners, such as um, immigration, working with the Federation College and Lincoln University, who have a lot of students that come in, eventually the work gets out and we're very open to that. So understanding that with students, if we hire a lot of students in our workplace from Canada and internationally, students come, they want the experience, they will leave. And I think as an employer you have to understand they want that experience, but you're not going to keep them all. Because once they get that experience, once they get that certification, they're, they're young, this might be their first job, they want to go into the world and experience new things. So as an employer, you have to understand that you're not going to keep every student that you train. Um, having an openness in your workplace to um, accept people who come from all over the world is important because um, it makes the workplace fun, truthfully. When you can share those experiences with everyone and learn to understand about different cultures, different foods, I'm not a big fan of different foods, but I'm learning and willing to try. So I think that's important that you're willing to try. And um, I think that what we have to understand in Northwest Ontario that might be a little different is that when someone new comes into your workplace and they come from a different country, Northwestern Ontario is a very harsh environment. So a, a new worker from a new country is as vulnerable or maybe more vulnerable than a young worker. So from a health and safety perspective, you have to ensure that your supervisors understand, ensure that as, a, as an employer you understand, that when they go out to work, a couple things are happening. One, they don't want to tell you that they're cold because they want to do the job and they want to prove that they can do this and they're going to be tough and they're not going to say anything. But they're at risk. They're at risk in minus 40 below weather of frostbite. But they don't want to say anything. Not only that, but they don't even know what frostbite is. So they can identify it. So it's, it's, it's letting your supervisors know that when they come into your workplace, they're very vulnerable. And you have to be aware of that. You have to share that with other workers so that they, they work with them, so that they understand that you want to make sure that they're safe. You want to make sure that they are healthy and that they're, that they're and it's, it's not accommodating them, but it's saying, here's the tools that you need, and don't be afraid to say anything. And the response is, well, you're not supposed to talk to your boss and tell them things. And it's like, don't be afraid to tell them. Please come forward and tell me, this is frostbite. We need to do something about it. As a, as a there's been other examples as well, but those are things, um, a lot of times too, the, the workers that we've had come into the workplace are afraid to say they don't understand. Because again, they don't want to disappoint. So when you explain something, there's a language barrier, somewhat of a language barrier, somewhat of a cultural barrier, but also that need to want to be accepted, to need to stay in, and, and keep your job. It's important, right? They came here and they want to keep their job, so they don't want to say, oh, I don't know how to do this. You know, I'm not quite sure. So rather than do that, they may just go ahead and try. But it's saying to them, please don't be afraid to come forward to us, to your manager, to your owner, and say, I'm not sure. But part of their culture is they don't want to disappoint. And, and, and the boss is the boss. And so it's teaching them that it's OK. It really is an open door policy. You're more than welcome to walk into the office and say, I don't understand, and be more than happy to explain it again <coughs> and again. And as you said, you know what? They will become your most dedicated employees. Thank you very much. Thank you again. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. There's a microphone right there.
here. It's not the bill. Oh, Ron, didn't see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, there. Thank you. So um, you're certainly well traveled and certainly have a lot of knowledge and experience in other countries. Have you run into, well, perhaps you certainly have, run into these types of situations in other countries? some of the immigration uh, factors that uh, I guess are walls to uh, people coming to Canada versus what they do in France or in other countries. Just a few comments on that. That's a great question. Um, well, in Europe, it's a little bit more um, open because the borders are open, so having been born in Britain, I had a European passport and you were allowed to move and work um, wherever you wanted to. Um, what I will say though is that I think is one of the reasons I did stay in Northwestern Ontario is the community welcomingness. And I can tell you when I moved to Marseille in France, I was young, 21, but it uh, was a very intimidating experience because the community wasn't welcoming. And yes, it's a big city, um, but when we talk about taking a personal interest in your employees, not just a professional interest if they're newcomers, it's so important to their settlement because, um, you know, the newcomers that come to my office, we make sure they're living in the right place, that they know where to go to open a bank account, that they know um, that they're not going to get ripped off by a, a, a slum landlord. So we take a personal interest in them. And so when I moved to Marseille, I moved into the red light district. I, I actually rented an apartment because I didn't know the, the community. And my first day at work, they asked me where I lived, and they told them, and they were like, oh, we need to move, right? But, but there wasn't the support when you arrived. Um, you were very much on your own. So I think that's a major benefit of being in Northwestern Ontario. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was the same in Australia. You know, they just didn't have the community um, behind you and engaged in newcomers as, as I find out they do here. So I think that's very unique. But I think we can do more. Um, when I was growing up uh, in Qatar, um, the policies there are very different. So uh, I'm in Canada, you can't immigrate to Qatar, so they don't allow immigration. Um, also, for work, you need to have a job before you arrive into the country. Um, so there, I mean, I can't. I can't say that you know uh, they have a similar model to, to Canada. Canada is very unique in, in the sense that you know they allow they allow immigration, they allow people to come in. Whereas there, if you have a job, um, that's the only way you can get into the country. And if you don't have a job, there's no other way of getting in. As an employer in Thunder Bay, I think one of the challenges that we faced is we really don't know. We, we don't know the immigration policies. We don't know the rules. We don't know how to do it. So most recently, we hired a couple from uh, South America, and we called our lawyer in Thunder Bay and said, "What are the? How do we do this? What do we do?" And he said, "No one in Thunder Bay can help you. You you need to go to a lawyer." So we ended up with a lawyer that had helped in the past in Toronto, which is fine. But I guess just just not really knowing, and and I'm going to be the first to admit I really don't know. We wanted to hire a student this summer to come to Canada because he was in a program that's not offered in Northwestern Ontario when we offer those services. We never did hire him because we tried to figure it out, but we just really don't know. We're not that big and we're not that sophisticated. So honestly. And I would just like to answer on the immigration thing. Um, for a student looking for a job, uh, there are a lot of uh, hoops that you have to jump. Um, so in order for, I don't know if the policy have changed or not, but before if an international student wants to apply for a job, the employer has to uh, advertise that job for six months. Um, and then if 
someone from you know a Canadian is a fit for the job, then that's the only way you can hire an international student. But even then, when a student is hired, the employer has to pay $1,200 for a labor assessment. Uh, these were the rules before. I don't know if these rules have been changed now or not. So um, rules and regulations for immigration changes according to the government that come to the power. Um, so I know that for students, it has actually become more difficult now to find work than it was, like, let's say, a couple of years ago. Um. So I have a question about that, uh, that point. Um, as employers who have hired uh, immigrants, can you tell us about some of the processes and challenges that you've gone through? Things like the labor market impact assessment, I hear that that is a real challenge, and I know Stephen is going to be talking about that in a little while, so I look forward to that discussion. Certainly something that the Chamber has been pushing to, uh, to make changes to, or perhaps do away with for small companies like ourselves. I'd like to hear about some of those challenges and how you either were successful, how you have you got through that process, or where maybe um, the process didn't work for you. Well, I can speak to uh, the challenges with the process for small business. I think they're significant versus large companies. So when I have, I can see it from two perspectives. So I work with Bombardier, who have a lot of euphemism. Again, they have very sophisticated. HR departments and lawyers um, who take care of all of those uh, things for them. And I think for small businesses, it is a little bit of a, you know, if you're if you're recruiting and you have two candidates, I think a lot of small businesses are swayed towards the non-newcomer just because of not wanting to tackle the process and go through all of those um, impact studies and things to, to be able to um, welcome that person into their, their workplace. So I think it is a barrier, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we're going through right now with um, the Ibrahim and my earlier is he just got married this summer in India and his wife now wants to come um, to Canada and he's recently arrived. Um, and now we're trying to support as an employer that process to help his wife settle in the community and so Abraham, being an international student, already had all of his uh, work visa and things in place. So we didn't have to help him with that, but now we're trying to help him from a family perspective. And his um, wife, new wife is um, an oral surgeon in India who cannot work in Canada at all. And, and so we don't want to see her working at Tim Bond's because she's a very talented young lady. And so how do we step up as employers um, and support the family? Um, and obviously working with Kathy's uh, team at the Bay Multicultural Association to try and navigate that process and get her some of the services and support she needs to achieve her potential here too. So that will be, I'll, I'll update you as we go because this is new for me too. Um, but I guess it's a willingness at this point to, to be able to, to work through those processes. It's been a challenge. Um, one of the things as employers, because we don't know where to go and we didn't know what to do, we, we were willing to take on a lawyer for these two professionals from Toronto, but it's an expense. It's very expensive. And it's at the risk of ultimately the federal government saying no. So when this family left Thunder Bay and had to return to the country with a potentially new visa with two to engineering, I was pretty sick that whole weekend. Because I thought, what if the government doesn't let them back in? I hope those lawyers did everything right. Because you're relying on, on experts that you hope are experts, and um, they're guiding you through something that really is is something you know nothing about. So, so it's a challenge, but it was a risk that we were willing to take, and it will pay off hopefully in the long run and create a, a better workplace. So um, just on the uh, point that you touched earlier about uh, qualifications, so as I mentioned earlier too, uh, a lot of people coming to Canada, some of them already had qualifications. And even if the government um, often you know, recognizes or they've gone through the process to, to renew their education or, or get a license to practice in Canada, 
Um, a lot of times we find that companies get get recognized their work experience um, that they have had from home. So that's that's another challenge that a lot of uh, job seekers uh, face too. Thank you. I think it's networking and making sure that our newcomers are out in the community and we're hearing their success stories and, and learning about the impact that they're having. And, and it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the panel discussion. One of the key things that you can do is take an interest in your employees outside of the, the, the work day. And so we try to bring um, our employees out to community events and introduce them and network them around uh, to new people. And when you hear about different people's stories and you hear about what they're doing and their businesses, and then I think it inspires others to do the same. And I think that's really the best we can do. And I know even through the Immigration Portal Project, we're trying to profile the stories of newcomers across the region who are doing great things in their communities. And, and those great things can also be staying at home and raising your family. I mean, it doesn't have, you don't have to be a, a major investor or a business owner, but um, I think showing how people are contributing to the community diversity, and making our region richer and, and more vibrant is really how we, we get people involved. Hello? Okay. So I think one of the things is that you support your employees, regardless of, of who they are or what they do, I think what it comes down to is support. And as an employer, we have to support our employees in whatever endeavors they do, whether it's the arts, whether it's culture, whether it's um, sports, whatever those organizations look like. And so as they're developing their relationships and their networks in Thunder Bay, supporting those networks along with it. So supporting the Indian Festival, if that's what it is, supporting um, Diwali, if that's what it is, Diwali, by the way, I think that's celebrated, and uh, those sorts of things. So I think what it comes down to is support. I'd like to thank the panelists. This morning. Thank you everyone for listening.